Please open your Bibles <clears throat> to um, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Let's give a reading to verses 31 to 36. John chapter 8, beginning with verse 31. Jesus, therefore, was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's offspring and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say, you shall become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. If, therefore, the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Well, obviously, the Son that is mentioned here in verse 36 would be the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is taking the place of one who has the authority and the ability to set people free. If the Son therefore make you free, you shall be free indeed. This freedom that Christ gives is an extraordinary freedom. Those who are made free by him are free, notice the word indeed, giving it a superlative degree of freedom. You shall be, no doubt, as to its occurrence. Nothing to hinder it, nothing to stop it, nothing to minimize it. You shall be free. It's an extraordinary freedom because he is our freedom. Christ is our freedom. Now, when we think of freedom, we, uh, we would think of bondage. Those who are somehow prisoners are bound in some way, need freedom. Now, you notice in the text that we read that these Jews took the position, we have never been in bondage to any man. Well, that was not true. Because they had been in bondage. The Jewish nation, the Jewish people were in bondage. Now, to show that what they said was not true, we must realize that bondage can be in two different categories. There's corporal bondage, by which we mean physical. Corporal or physical, there is corporal or physical bondage. People who are in jail, prison, or in bondage. Their bodies are being held captive. 
in a certain location, and when they go to the front door, it's not open. They're in bondage. But there's not only corporal or bodily or physical bondage, there is such a thing as spiritual bondage. People can be bound spiritually. Now let's apply those two categories to the Jewish nation. Those Jews who were saying, we've never been in bondage, oh yes they had. They had been in bondage in Egypt to the Philistines and to the Ammonites and the Moabites during the time of the judges. Seventy years under bondage in Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar as a nation, as a people. They were not free to live as they wanted to live. Interestingly enough, those very Jews who were telling Christ at this time we were never in bondage, were in bondage to Rome. Now, they were also spiritually in bondage. Now, you can see the fact that they were denying the reality of their bondage. And people today are doing the same thing. People today, without Christ, without God, are in spiritual bondage. And many deny it. Abjectly. Saying that taking the position that their bondage is actually their freedom. They're bound by sin, this sin, that sin, drunkenness and licentiousness and drugs. And they're considering themselves free to be able to do those things. And they look at Christians as being in bondage. Christians who, quote, can't do this and can't do that and not supposed to do this. And they consider Christians as being in bondage when in reality they're in bondage. In fact, the truth is every person born into this world is born in bondage to the sin of Adam. We're born under the guilt of his sin. Why? Because we were in Adam when he sinned. And he was our representative of the whole human race. And if you could trace your lineage back, 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 farther and farther and farther, if you could do it, you would eventually come up with Adam. Because you were in Adam when he was created. And when Adam sinned, we sinned in Adam because he was our representative. So when we were born in that little innocent lump of clay in your hand, not innocent, guilty. Guilty of Adam's sin. But beyond that, there's the bondage of the sin nature. And in that little baby lies the seed of the potential of any sin that any person has ever been able to commit. It's not a little innocent lump of clay that you can mold any way you want to. Yes, you can to some degree. But that child has a sin nature. And as we've described so many times, 
You don't have to teach that child how to lie. Amen. You don't have to say, Johnny, come over here. Daddy wants to tell you and teach you how to tell a lie. You don't have to call the little child over and the mother says, now it's time, dear, for you to learn how to have a tantrum fit and lose your temper. So let me show you how to do it. They know. They know. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish and want to take a toy away from somebody else. It's all there. Bondage. And the worst degree. Well, let me deal now with three aspects. We're, we've covered them somewhat, but let me deal with them a little bit more in detail. We have the bondage of the guilt of sin. We've just talked about that. And there's a sense in which that guilt accumulates. Isaiah says, each one of us has gone astray after his own way. All of us have gone astray like sheep. So as we grow and develop in life, before we come to Christ, we're each one going his own individual way of sin. Some with this sin, some with these sins. But it's our own individual building up of and accumulating of the guilt, not only of the guilt of innate sin, but becoming guilty of our own sins that we commit, adding to the guilt. Now at some point, that sin has to be dealt with either in salvation or in final judgment, but that sin will be dealt with. And in some sense, it's kind of like a criminal who maybe has not by the court of law yet been declared guilty, although that can happen in some legal sense. But there is guilt. And if that guilt is becoming known to the officials, at some point that guilt has to be dealt with. They have to either be proven innocent or proven guilty. And perhaps you know that if a person commits a felony, a felony crime in a state, and then leaves that state to avoid prosecution, it becomes a federal offense. So now, the FBI is looking for this person and he's been charged with, he's been declared to be fleeing the state to avoid prosecution of a certain crime, of a fed crime that is now federal because they have left the state. Now, all of that to say simply this, that as people are living out their life without Christ, they are accumulating, as it were, a cloud of guilt hanging over their head. And that cloud becomes bigger and heavier and bigger and heavier every day until one day that cloud comes crashing down upon them in judgment. Either judgment in this life, if not judgment in this life, judgment in the final day of judgment. Do you not see how oppressive that is? Do you not see how binding that is? And that a person who is living like that is under bondage. Now, who can set that person free? Only Christ, only Christ, who was delivered up for our transgressions and raised from the dead because of our offenses. 
Christ is our freedom. From the guilt of sin, from the penalty of sin. But secondly, he is our freedom from the power of sin. From that remaining sin that dwells within us. This too can hold a person captive. How many times do people say to themselves, if not to anyone else, I'm going to overcome this habit. I'm going to quit that uh, drunkenness or drugs or sex or whatever it is. <coughs> only to fall into that sin again and again and again. Because there is no power manifested in their life to overcome that bondage. If the Son shall make you free, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free from the guilt of sin, from the power of sin, Turn with me to Romans 6 and look at verse 14. Romans 6, 14 to 20. Actually, 14 to 19. Romans 6, beginning with verse 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you past tense were slaves of sin. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Skip down to verse 22. But now having been free from sin, and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. There are no free men. All men are either slaves of Satan and sin or they're slaves of God, servants of God. No third category. But then there's People who are being held in bondage because of fear. Fear, in this case, of death. Fear of death. All by nature, to some degree or another, are in that kind of bondage. Except those who, of course, know that death is but the way we go to be with God. And while we may fear the process of dying because of all that that might involve, as believers, we do not fear death. There's a difference. We're set free from that fear by the Holy Spirit as comforter. And we can cheerfully even look death in the face, knowing that we are reconciled with God, our Father. And when the cancer doctor told Loretta she had less than six months to live, she looked him right in the face and said, I'm ready to go meet my Lord with all confidence. That's freedom. That's freedom in this aspect. Well, I want us to think now more about this freedom. What kind of freedom 
is it? Well, it is real. It is not imaginary. It's not something that we dream up. But it is real and genuine. Bondage is real, but the freedom when, which Christ gives is a reality. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free. Indeed, no doubt, no question. Free from the guilt of sin. Free from the dominion of sin. Free from the fear of death. Those things that can hold us in extreme bondage. So it is a real, substantial freedom. But it is also an inward freedom. Not just outward, but having to do with the very inner life of our being. It goes that deep. It is a reality. This is a hymn we sing. It is well with my soul. When it is well with your soul, regardless of whatever else is going on, it is well. Because of that inward peace and joy and reality of the presence of God in the midst of a storm-tossed sea. But it is a costly freedom. It cost our Lord the suffering on the cross to gain, to earn, to merit that freedom on our behalf. Suffering the agony of death, suffering the agony of bearing at that very moment the guilt of those sins of those whom he came to save. He paid the price for our deliverance. The price of his own precious blood. Turn with me to 1 Peter verse 18 and 19. First Peter 1 Peter 1.18 knowing that you were not redeemed, that would be including being set free from captivity, with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Well, freedom comes by paying a price or freedom comes by fighting for your deliverance. If a nation is being held, a people are being held, and they can manage to get the arms together and they can overcome by fighting the controlling power, they can gain their freedom. Well, in our case, Christ paid the price but he also fought the battle. And he won the battle against Satan, against hell, and against the powers that be. It's a comfortable freedom. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that it includes many exceeding great and precious privileges. The blessings of living a life honoring to God. The blessings of being able to come to the throne of grace and prayer. We have the freedom to do that. The blessings of looking into the Word of God and Claiming the, the reality of those promises. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The 
being able to plead from your heart, oh God, please don't leave me. Amen? What a freedom. What a privilege that comes with our freedom. There are certain privileges. Privilege of being free from guilt, being free from the domineering power of sin. Though that sin remains, it does not reign because we are not willing servants of that sin any longer. Though we may fall in a certain time of temptation, but it wasn't because we were willingly submitting to that. And God gives us a heart to love His Word. We no longer view God's law as, as binding and irritating. Oh, how I love thy law, says David in Psalm 119. He's not looking for some reason to get out from under that or to say, I'm, I, I'm no longer obligated. No, David says, oh, how I love thy law. That's freedom. Real freedom. Of course, people who have been parts of cults, wrong <coughs> teaching, they become free from those things. free from false teaching and the impositions of false teaching. There's real freedom. We're not free from afflictions, but we are free from the evil of affliction. Um, turn with me to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. I don't know if I can illustrate this, adequately, but let me try. I had parents who were disciplinarians. They disciplined me. They punished me when I needed it. And let's suppose that if on occasion I had displeased my parents by disobeying them or not fulfilling their wishes in some way or another, and my mother or my father or both might have said, uh, you can't go out and play this afternoon. And my friends were out playing ball. I was held in bondage in the house. And I could say, oh, woe is me. But at my period in life today, I can look back on that and say, that was a blessing. They did me a favor. And that bondage which pinched at the moment was for my real freedom. There was blessing attached to it that I couldn't see. And that happens time and time again and again in our lifetime. And sometimes we go through very deep
waters of trial. We're, de we're being disciplined by the Lord, but it's for our good, it's for our blessing. It's not unfair bondage. We have, as God's people, been delivered from the sting of those afflictions. And we know the privileges and the blessings because God is using them to mature us into a greater effectiveness in our Christian life. That's real freedom, brother. What about death? What about death? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. Have we been delivered? 1 Corinthians 15. But when this perishable, that's this body, will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, that would be at the return of Christ, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory, the freedom, the liberty through our Lord Jesus Christ. Free even from the final results of death. We're free in a very positive way. To be able to take advantage of many of the privileges of what God has provided. I've mentioned the throne of grace. I've mentioned the promises of the Bible. We are at liberty to serve him. All the days of our life. Well, dear ones, let's make sure that we are using our freedom to its very height of benefit. And now, in closing, I want to share this with you. Raymond, one of the men that we have ministered to in prison now probably for 10 years, as you know, was released. At the age of 15, he was given a life sentence he served 34 years in prison. Some of you may recall that he came here with his wife to meet me and to visit our church. Now think with me for a moment. That door opens and you enter into that building. And you're confined and you're held there for 30 years four years. What do you think it would be like when the day came and they opened the door and he walked out? A free man. Think of that moment the reality of that moment, gripping his heart. Dear ones, that doesn't even compare to when Christ does a work of salvation in a person's heart. And they have been held bond in bondage and in captivity to sin, slaves. And 
Christ comes and opens the door. And you walk out, free man, free woman, boy, girl, teenager. One of the young men that was not in prison, I've had opportunity to work with, told me when he was 12, 13 years old, he and his friend were stealing liquor and wine from the convenience stores and getting drunk every day after school. He said, when I smoked a marijuana cigarette, it didn't do anything to me. He said, the next day I smoked one and inhaled it. And he said, from that moment on, the thought came to me, this is something I want to do every day of my life for the rest of my life. That's bondage of the worst kind. He was in rehabilitation at least three times for months and months and months. But there come a day when he came to know the Lord and he doesn't smoke marijuana anymore, doesn't drink anymore. He finishes degree from college and has a good job. From being a kid, messed up in real bondage. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free. And all of that word means all that you could pack into that word. Indeed. And that's like putting a big exclamation point after that word. It's a reality. Christ is our freedom in every sense of the word. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you that it has pleased you to do a mighty work of grace in our lives at some point. Setting us free from the guilt, the power. One day, we'll be with you. Free. At last, from the very presence of sin. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in taking full advantage of the liberty that we have in Christ to serve you as long as we live. In his name we pray. Amen.